I'm Ari Gronich, and this is Create a New Tomorrow Podcast. And welcome to another special edition of Create a New Tomorrow. I'm your host, Ari Gronich. I'm here in Denver, Colorado, and I'm talking to Chris Gieske, who is a uh, strength and conditioning coach. He was a military vet who started his career helping to uh, rehabilitate uh, wounded vets as well. So I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about who he is and why uh, we're here, why we're talking. All right. Well, my name is Chris Gieske, as I already said. I'm, I am a strength and conditioning coach, and I have a, a neurological background through Z Health. Um, and I got started in that through um, getting medically discharged from the military, actually, um, to, due to a lot of back pain, um, a lot of hip pain, knee pain, shoulders, you know, different things like that. And uh, the first time I went to this place called LifeQuest Transitions, they had this big Z Health banner, right? And we we're kind of almost voluntold to go, <laughs> you know, I love that term voluntold. Um, so I went in there, I'm just like, okay, whatever. I don't know what this is all about, but they're talking about all this neurological training and then doing a little bit of strength conditioning on top of that. And I met a friend and mentor of mine named Dr. Grove Higgins. And he started just doing some ankle mobility work with me. And when I didn't have very much mobility in my back at the time, I could only bend you know, just a, a few inches before I just had excruciating lower back pain. And after just doing a few like ankle drills, mobility drills, I was almost touching the floor and it floored me because I was like, there's no way that something so stupid could have worked so well, you know? And so over time I started going there and I got myself better and I started feeling really good. And um, there's another program out there called the Mission Continues. And basically what they did is they let you volunteer at any nonprofit and they would give you a stipend. So I decided to start to work for um, LifeQuest and I, they, were, they allowed me to take the Z Health certifications for free, which was amazing because those are about two or three grand a pop, right? And being a veteran coming out of the military, you know, you don't get a whole lot of spending money. So it was pretty awesome. And so then I started working there with a lot of uh, wounded veterans of PTSD and uh, veterans that just were overall broken because the military does what the military does and breaks you, you know, a lot of anterior movement, a lot of people getting really, uh, a lot of bad backs, knees, shoulders, and not only were able to rehabilitate them, you know, to go back to live with their families and, and cut their medications like by 80%, some of them. Wow. Um, but also, if some of them got to return to duty, they didn't think they'd be able to return to duty. So that was pretty awesome. So, you know, being that you've been in the military and then had to exit the military due to medical, you know, issues and so forth. And we've all heard that kind of the system is broken, especially for vets. So what was your experience going through the VA programs and trying to get yourself healthy uh, to where you weren't in so much pain. What was what was that experience like? What were the areas that you could see room for improvement? Let's say. Um, definitely, it's it's like the normal medical system, right? You go in and they're like, "Here's some pain pills," you know, "Here's some uh, NSAIDs," you know, or some anti-inflammatories, and you, you you take them and you, and you don't feel any better and. And then all of a sudden, I just happened to stumble in to this place called LifeQuest through a captain that was, uh, I was going through, um, it's called rear detachment. It's, it's a special, you know, brigade that you're in as you're transitioning out. And he was like, hey, go check this place out. And I think there's a huge con disconnect between, you know, not just like chiropractic, but also uh, training, neurological training. There's a whole plethora of um, different modalities you can do to make yourself better that, you know, people don't realize exist out there. So, you know, what's your mission? Because, you know, really this is all about having a platform for vets and for, you know, really anybody who's suffering from pain and trauma and, and so on to get results and get better. So, 
you know, what would be the things that you would say need to be fixed? The, 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 you know, the solutions to some of these issues. So the solutions definitely is, um, people that do do like, um, training, um, physical, you know, therapists and stuff like that. I think there needs to be better communication that happens between, um, trainers and that aspect because, um, I used to work for um, National Personal Training Institute and the owner was like, hey, Ace just wants to know what do you feel would be um, a really good, you know, uh, type of program that they should start to implement. And I was like, you know, it'd be awesome if we could get uh, personal trainer strength conditioning coaches, corrective exercise specialists to be able to communicate a little bit better with doctors. So I think the communication there is something that needs to be a little bit tweaked and fixed. Yeah, you know, I, I talk about this a lot, actually. The, I, I feel like between the modalities, there's a language barrier. It's like speaking Spanish and English, right? Yeah. There's a language barrier there because doctors speak a specific language chiropractors speak a different language, massage therapists speak a different language, physical therapists a different language, and personal trainers a different language. Mm -hmm. And you might say, wait, this is the same body, so why so many languages? But it's the, the same thing as saying uh, an endocrinologist versus a proctologist versus a neurosurgeon, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many different places that the rabbit hole sinks deep into. Mm -hmm. And so it's incumbent upon the training, in my opinion, to begin, and this is to all the schools out there, any regulating body, you know, listen, listen to this advice because it would be incumbent upon you as the educators to educate these modalities in the language of the other people that would have added benefit to the patient, right? Yeah, absolutely. That way you can still specialize, but you have respect and you can refer with knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, there's just some part of that as well is, is just with um, our, our, our medic, medical system, right? And with chiropractors and you have the physical therapists and you have, you know, corrective exercise coaches. It's almost like sometimes they just kind of turn off because they're so educated in medication and in, in doing an, a steroid injection versus going, okay, what's the movement dysfunction going on here? Because that's the main thing I look at. When somebody comes in my office, I watch how they come in, how they're moving, how they stand up, how they go bend over, pick something up. And they could have, you know, all kinds of different uh, movement errors that, you know, a doctor would just look at them and go, okay, well, let's have you, you know, do this steroid injection or whatever. And then it wears off and you're like, man, the pain's right back. And I work at a chiropractic office right now. And, you know, I'll see some of these patients that come in week in and week out and then I'll take them in. I'll be like, hey, you've got a movement, you know, problem. It's not necessarily you have a back issue, right? Right. You know, it could be, you know, something going on with a thoracic that's not moving right or your SI joints just not moving right as you walk. And you get that quick fix, but the pain comes back, right? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the way that that happens, because, you know, as I always tell chiropractors when I'm consulting with them is, you know, you need to train your massage therapist in how to work with you, how to work with their patients in order to support what you're trying to do. Because if you get an adjustment, a half hour to an hour later, you're already back out of place because your muscles are controlling whether you're in place or not. Mm -hmm. So you got to train the therapist who's, who's there to support your patients, not just in a relaxation massage, but in how to specifically work on the anatomy that you need worked on mm -hmm. in order for you to get the benefit of the work you just did. Right. Yes. Yeah. And that goes the same for being able to tell a personal trainer or a strength and conditioning coach or somebody like that, the same kind of thing. Okay. I have this patient here who is not getting better from my treatments for three years. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe they need something 
different yep. and an add-on. That doesn't mean not going to the chiropractor exactly. or not going to the physical therapist or not going to the massage therapist because this happens no matter what the field is, mm -hmm. right? The personal trainer doesn't necessarily want to send them to somebody else. Mm -hmm. The massage therapist, you know, thinks that they'll, they don't have enough money to work with both of them, you know, both yeah. them and somebody else. And so we're not doing the referrals that really would get the patient better because of our own fears. Fear. Right. Yeah. So as a, as an audience member, you can kind of relate this to your experiences with being in treatment, being in pain, you go to a first doctor and they give you some pills, the pills don't work. So you have to go to somebody else. Did they, did that doctor refer you to the other person or did you have to go find them through your friends and family? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the way that you got to them and how do you know then that they're the ones that are gonna be able to take care of your specific problem? And that's just an industry-wide system-wide issue, issue. Mm -hmm. that it's really hard to educate a consumer or a patient or an audience on because it's become, begun to be incumbent upon you to really do your research on who you're going to. And it really should be a more of a referral system from yeah. one professional expert to another. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're talking about the fear thing, you know, for years, and I've never understood this, sorry, like for a long time, is that a lot of medical doctors will view things like chiropractic, like is almost voodoo. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a real stigma out there. Like, even still, even though, you know, you'll get somebody that comes in, they'll, they'll you know, adjust them, they'll be out of pain and good, or, you know, such as doing some of the stuff that I do with some of the brain training stuff, they're like, like I've talked to um, a, a friend of mine who's who's a orthopedic surgeon. And he's just like, eh, you know, just kind of just like brushes it off as voodoo or whatever. But it's like, no, these these are modalities that actually work. And and it's not like I've seen it with one or two people. Like I've worked with hundreds of patients, and all of them d generally get something out of it really well. No, absolutely. And you know that that is to me still the language issue because they don't understand the language we're speaking, even though it sounds the same as what they're saying. Yeah. Right. But it comes across as, for instance, a, a medical doctor speaks in scientific lab terms, mm -hmm. typically, while uh, they don't give much credence to anecdotal evidence, mm -hmm. only really to scientific evidence or lab evidence, mm -hmm. right? chiropractors, massage therapists, physical therapists in some cases, nutritionists, herbalists, acupuncturists, et cetera, mm -hmm. require a lot of anecdotal evidence. Right. And so those two languages don't necessarily match. Mm -hmm. And therefore, because the, the science hasn't confirmed in a lab that information, they don't know how to take it. Mm -hmm. necessarily. So, you know, again, it goes back to language and it goes back to the education yeah. and the system wide issue that, that basically takes some people and turns them into, Oh, they're just right. <laughs> He's just a personal trainer. He's right. just a massage therapist. You wouldn't say mm -hmm. he's just a neurosurgeon. Right. Right. Exactly. But why do we allow that? to happen in our profession? Mm -hmm. Why do we allow that to be? Because we don't speak the same language as the people who are currently the most regarded yeah. profession, right? Mm -hmm. there, think of another profession that's more highly regarded. No, oh, there isn't, you know, I mean, and I think it goes back to exactly what you said, education, you don't know what you don't know. And, and they're trained in one way, right? And then you're trained in a completely different, you know, way. And, and they don't have the, the extra knowledge that you have. And, and like you said, it's that communication, like, loss there that happens. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, that's why I say, you know, we, we can bridge these gaps. Mm -hmm. But we have to have these discussions in order to get clear on where those gaps are. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. If absolutely. we don't have if we don't have the discussion about where the gaps are, then we don't know what we need to fill. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. for you, for instance, when you go back to doing what you're doing, you might have a different perspective from this conversation about how you speak to the doctor. Oh, absolutely. Right? Because you're going to be able to speak to them in a different way. And listen to this. If you're a personal trainer, a massage therapist, an alternative healthcare provider in any way, by learning the language of the people who have the respect, you will begin to get the respect of those people, mm -hmm. which means that it will translate to the respect of your communities in general. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. It's funny that you're talking about, you know, going in and opening that communication barrier, right? So about a week ago, I had a friend of mine and she works for a physical therapist, you know, and she said, hey, my physical therapist wants to meet you because I told her about all the awesome stuff that you've done and you felt my shoulder so much. And I go, okay, cool. So, you know, I get in there and I expect to you know, have a sit down, maybe a lunch. And she goes, no, go to the treatment room. I'm like, all right. So this is going to be a trial by fire, right? So um, she goes, well, Lacey's having a little bit of shoulder issues today. How would you fix it? So it's like double barrels, ready to go. <laughs> you better, here you go. Five minutes, you know, show me what you got, kid. So I was like, okay. So I go in and, you know, I just, you know, do a little bit of muscle testing on her shoulder. And she's like, yeah, that kind of hurts there. And I'm like, okay. And I just had her do just, you know, a motor map of her scapula, just move her scapula around, right? And just really get a good motor map in her brain of where that is. Can and you, I, before you go on, just tell them what a motor map is so, so that. Yeah, okay. So a motor map is in your brain of where your joints are in space and time. And then in the full movement pattern of that joint, right? And if you don't have a good motor map of a certain joint, it will start to cause, um, nociceptors to go up to your brain. Okay. So what nociceptors are is a lot of people think of them as pain receptors, but they're threat receptors, right? Because pain doesn't live in the body. It lives up here, it lives in your brain. And um, basically if, if, if you start to move that around or move an immobilized joint that's supposed to be mobile around your brain, then maps it a little better. And then when it maps it better, a lot of times threat will go down, which means pain will start to decrease movement uh, flexibility starts to go up and strength can go up so i had her just do a little motor map with her scapula being able to just move only that single joint and then i went to go muscle test again boom she was strong she had no pain there and she's like cool thanks and that was my opening to that physical therapist is they were like okay cool <laughs> tell me more so then i went on to go tell her more about you know the brain training stuff i do working with vestibular visual system as well as, you know, working with neuromechanics, but also biomechanics. So I could speak her language a little bit as well. So let's talk a little bit about neuromechanics and how they differ from biomechanics and a little bit more about, you know, how the brain, because most people think I hit my thumb with a hammer, right? My thumb is throbbing. I am, I have pain in my thumb, Yeah. right? This is the, the process in the brain, right? or that the thinking brain goes through, yeah, the thinking right? Brain, yeah. So what is the process in the actual body going through? Okay. And then what's the difference between the neuromechanics, biomechanics, and those kinds of things? Because what, what we want to give to the audience is things that they can learn, that they can then start to do so that they can change their own world, create a new tomorrow today for themselves. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So the best way I get people to, to distinguish between their actual brain and the thinking brain, right, is I used to work with veterans, okay? So my, my friend worked with this one guy, and he was blown off from the legs, you know, from the hip down. Like, he had no lower extremities whatsoever. And you'd be working with him, you'd be like, man, I just feel like my toes are being spread apart. Okay, this guy has no legs at all, right? But what's still there? the map in his brain to that lower extremity, right? So another another way I can put this, right, is if I had a, if you're a paraplegic, right, and I took a knife and I stabbed you in the leg, right? You just kind of look at me like I was a jerk, which <laughs> you should, right? But you would not feel any pain. Why? Because there is nothing going to your brain, signaling to your brain, hey, something's going on, right? 
And basically what the brain does is it does three things, right? It receives information, right? Then it, uh, or, or it gets sent input, right, from your body. Then it receives and decides what to do with it. And then it sends an output, right? And that output is either, you know, I can move my hand through you know, space and time or how that hurts or, you know, glandular functions such as sweat, right, or, or salivating. And if, if the input going in is disrupted, right, it's going to send a poor output, right? And, and basically in Z-Health, what they call it is a threat bucket, right? So you have, you know, going through your day, you have, you know, stress, you have, you know, all these different things going in, right? Um, maybe bad movement patterns. Um, and if you have enough of that nociceptor information going to your brain, right, or detecting threat, you know, it's going to say, mm, I don't like this. I need to, you know, protect myself a little bit. And that's ultimately what pain is. It's a protective mechanism. I think that's an interesting thing for people to, to understand. Mm -hmm. Pain is a threat mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. P pain. I mean, your brain makes, makes, protects you, right? And a way it protects you is through pain. Right. It's almost counterintuitive. But if I had like, for instance, I'll take, for example, a guy that I've worked with and he had rotator cuff surgery and I, and I worked with him after he was cleared with a physical therapist and everything. He just didn't have full range of motion and he would get to here. Right. And it would hurt. Ow, ow, ow. Right. Well, if he kept going there, what happens? It's kind of like a fly that is in a cage or a frog in a cage jumping jumping hitting the ceiling mm -hmm. and then eventually right doesn't want to go above this above that point so you could eventually take away the ceiling and they'll never <laughs> right. escape right so what, what eventually can happen as well is is a pain loop right so people who are in pain can get really good at being in pain so eventually, you know, it'll get to where you can't move it here, and then you can't move it here, then you can't move it here. So all, all, we, all I do with him, right, is, is I started doing just little motions that didn't hurt, right? And then eventually it's like, oh, and then he's able to go higher and then higher and then higher, right? Because I reduced that threat to his brain, right, that said something's going on there and I don't like it, right? Because he was moving in pain-free ranges of motion. He goes, oh, that's, that's okay. And, you know, there's obviously some strength and stability that can be built up there too as well. But ultimately it's, it's what's going on up here, right? How threatened is this, right? And if this is really, really threatened, it's going to go, how can I shut this person down? Wow. That's an interesting, interesting way of looking at the, that particular science. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy the way, the way they, they teach in the Z health curriculum and everything, but the more you get into it, it's like the more down the rabbit hole you go. <laughs> right. So how would you say, like, I've trained a lot of Olympic athletes that seem to have a very high pain threshold, mm -hmm. right? So as a therapist, uh, I, I was very proud to have my patients basically say it was the medieval torture chamber <laughs> and that the table was, you know, the rack. My, yeah. my, my therapy table was the rack and, uh, and, you know, they felt like champions just getting out of off the table. <laughs> right. right. Cause uh, you know, I, I learned a little bit about Indian, you know, way religion and way of, of looking at things. And to the Indians, they, the ceremonies are hard mm -hmm. so that life will be easier. So yeah. if you think about their ceremonies, things like sweat lodges and yeah. vision quests where no food, no water for four days and sun dances out in the middle of the summer, uh, right? Yeah. They're difficult. They're the hard. ceremonies are yeah. hard. Well, that's the same thing with, with how I figured therapy should be a little bit is <laughs> therapy should be so hard that when you're in competition, it's easy. You're just flying through the competition. You got no worries at all. <laughs> right. You didn't have to do that for an hour. You just did that for, you know, 20 seconds right? or, or whatever, you know, like length, length of time it is. And so <laughs> yeah, I've seen some of your tables. 
things. I looked you up on YouTube and saw some of the ab work and I was like, oh man. Yeah, that ab routine is, I still have not found anybody who can beat that ab routine. Oh my God. <laughs> it looks it's That is a half hour of ungodly torture that I put, so it's on YouTube. You could go check it out. Dominic Arnold, who was on this show, right? We, we did a video. Now, mind you, I am about 120 pounds heavier with long curly <laughs> hair. <laughs> and, uh, and I look a little bit different. Dominic looks the same. Well, not the same as when he was competing, but you know, anyway, he was on this show. We have it on YouTube. So go check it out on, on the YouTube channel. But um, there's an ab routine, it's 30 minutes long. And my challenge is to, to watch like the first five minutes and then try to do oh. what's there. Oh. And then watch the next five minutes and try to do what's there and see where it is that you are tortured to, to the point where your nociceptors, yeah. right? Are firing threat <laughs> and you're stopped <laughs> because very few, I mean, he, you know, Dominic is an Olympic champion, world record breaker, American record holder. I mean, he, he was an amazing Olympic athlete. Right. And it tortured him to the point of no return. Mm -hmm. But he felt like, as he would say, I feel like Bruce Lee. <laughs> I feel like a ninja when I'm done with, when I'm, I leave, I feel like yeah. a gymnast. He's like, like a gymnast, <laughs> a ninja. Right. Yeah. All those things are, are things that help people you know, they feel gymnasts feel good. They're flexible. They're strong. They're mm -hmm. right. Oh, yeah. Martial arts, Marta's strong. They're flexible. They're they, right. Mm -hmm. That's how people want to be able to move. Mm -hmm. So try to do that, that, that routine, but I, I'm intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think that that getting that pain receptor up mm -hmm. while you're in therapy. Yeah. I'm scaring people right now. I know this. <laughs> um, actually helps to make it so that it doesn't go up when it's needed. Right. Don't see everyone is in a bad mood or else you'll be making them faces. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, what do you think of that concept that if you, if you have this flood of nociceptors and your body and your, and you feel great at the, when you're done, right? Yeah. Cause that's what the therapy does. You go through it, but you feel great when you're done. Yeah. So when you're in competition, your body is just going, oh, this is easy. Oh, I can yeah, do this all no day problem. long, right? right? No problem. Yeah, and what you're talking about is peaking, right? Exactly. So you take somebody to a peak, right? And and that has its place, right? So tearing down muscle to build it up, right? That has that definitely has a, a point in there, right? Um, but there's also stages, right? That you have to program around that as well. It's like, okay, what days do I go in and I just tear it down, right? And then what days do I go, okay, I need to back up a little. Right. Because I can tell, you know, if my patient comes in, I can look at him and go, you're not ready to train heavy today. Right. You're you're you got up off that couch really, really slow. Right. I mean, they're they're, they're you know, so as might be grabbing their back might be out or what have you from whatever happened during the week. And some days you just have to look and you go. And that's that's the art about being a strength conditioning coach or, or PT or whatever you want to be is is you have to know when to say go. And you have to know when to say no, right? Right. So there's there's a point there to where you want to push them pretty well, right? But on top of that, I can I can use a lot of neurological tools to help them perform even better, right? Than what they would have if they hadn't done some of the stuff that I do with them, such as you know the motor mapping of hips and, and and ankles and everything like that. But another one that isn't really talked about too much or I haven't heard very many other strength conditioning coaches or um, personal trainers talk about is vision training, right? And there's a huge science behind vision training now as well, right? And, and to where can you, you know, look in a certain area or, or snap your eyes and snap right to a target, right? And, right. If, and if you can't, right, that's, that's another neurological issue. It's another neurological deficit that can send nose receptors up the brain going, mm something's going on i don't know what's going on right so if you can't do this <laughs> if you can't snap three yeah. times fast <laughs> right and land on the same spot you might have a neurological disorder neurological deficit right 
So, I mean, it's very important, especially in things like football and baseball, if you think about it, right? Something comes at you really quick, you have to look real fast and catch it, right? And there was an amazing study done and they took a football team. There's two different football teams. One, they just did complete, just strength conditioning training with them. The other one, they did about half visual and vestibular work um, and half um, uh, strength conditioning stuff. And what they noticed was, is that the people that did the vision training and, and vestibular stuff was that their injury rate was significantly less, right? Because not only is your eyes very, very, you know, important, not only to see peripheral stuff, right? But also before I step, right? It's, it's very important to be able to see before I step. And what they found with like a lot of ACL injuries and stuff was like that as people would step before they could snap their eyes to where they're going. Ah, uh, <laughs> so, so yeah. A lot of ankle injuries. Ankles. Yeah. A lot of ankle injuries. So number one injury in all sports, ankle injuries, number one injury and reason for showing up in an ER for just general citizenry, ankle injuries. Mm -hmm. It's the number one injury for showing up. And, and a lot of that is hand-eye coordination. Yes. Right? Yeah. A lot of that is the visuals. You didn't see that step that was right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And so you fell off the curb, yeah, so to speak, yep. and twisted your ankle. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, this visual mapping mm -hmm. is really important. We learned a lot about visual mapping in NLP yeah, and in EMDR. Mm -hmm. and in REM therapy, rapid eye movement therapy, because yep. we would trigger these different locations. But, you know, I had a, I had a chiropractor friend in Beverly Hills who was an amazing chiropractor, but he hardly ever did an adjustment of any kind yeah. until he figured out where your brain was screwy. Yeah. So he would do the muscle testing while you're looking up and to the left. Mm -hmm. And then do the muscle testing again when you look up to the right, I do a lot down to yeah. the left, down to the right, mm -hmm. to the side, to the other side, right? Mm -hmm. And then by doing that, he would figure out exactly where in your brain that muscle was being shortened or tightened or turned, you know, the nerve yeah. turned into a pain signal. And I mean, he he was incredible. He was an interesting guy. You would have liked him. I would have loved he, him. He had a he had a <laughs> yeah. tree growing in the middle of his office. <laughs> That's great. Like the they built the building around the tree. <laughs> no way. It was freaking awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. So yeah, building off the, the visual that he was talking about with the muscle testing, what's interesting is is when we find ourselves in a day and an age, right, with COVID, right, everybody's in front of their co computer for hours at a time. Or, or people who work at home on Zoom calls all the time. I had a patient that came in with a ton of shoulder pain, right? Not only does that posture, you know, deviate, you know, the shoulders and all that stuff, but no matter what I did, I couldn't activate her lats. And I'm like, what is going on? I cannot get her lats to fire. So I was like, okay, let's do a little bit of visual work. I know it seems a little weird, but let's let's just go there, right? So I had her look in certain positions and sure enough, just doing a little bit of training, a little bit of eye asymmetrics, that lat fired really hard where I couldn't even pull it out. Wow. I was like, okay, so here's some drills for you to do. And, and some of them were just eye isometric stairs, just, you know, taking your finger and looking, right? Something as stupid and easy as that, right? Helped her function and fire so much better. Wow. There are alternatives to your pain. You do not need the opioids, the NSAIDs, which really don't work much anyway. You can actually go to somebody who knows their stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So how would somebody find somebody like you? I'm not going to go to you yet because we're not done, but yeah, absolutely. Um, how does somebody find somebody like you? How do they learn that somebody like you exists? when it's not being told by the mainstream, you know, medical yeah. system that you exist, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So how does somebody find somebody like you, somebody like me who is trained in so many different modalities? And if one tool in our toolbox doesn't work, we got 50 more that yeah. can come out, right? Right. And then how do we get that message across 
to the mainstream medical system that we exist more, how do we get people like you louder, yeah. right? So that you can say, no uncertain terms, I'm here, I exist, this is what I do, this is the benefit I give, mm -hmm. and I'm open for business because, right. you know, the, the, the truth is, is that people will vote with their pocketbooks before they vote any other way. Oh, yeah. And if somebody doesn't know you exist, they can't vote for you. Right. Right. So we need to get this message across more, especially in the mainstream medical system. But how do we get somebody like you talking this way to doctors? No, oh, yeah. It's, right. It's, and it's, how does somebody find somebody like you that, that has this kind of training? Yeah, that's that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Trying to get our voices a little louder that, you know, have these alternate modalities that you don't have to rely on a lot of pain medication and, you know, the medical system forever and injections and all kinds of things. Um, there is actually um, on the Z Health website, you can actually find trainers online and you can look at your area and, and see which trainers you have and what they're certified in. What, okay, so what website is that? So it's uh, zhealth.net or .com, I believe. Okay. And you go there and they have a- We got the trainer. shirt. We got the Z shirt Z on Health. for it, right. Z Health. Yeah. And you go there, .com, and um, there's a find a trainer link and you just put in your address and you can find some that are around you. And if they're a master trainer, if they have a few certifications, like I've had three certifications I've been in so far. And with that, I mean, you just have so many more tools in your toolbox, you know, when, when you're in the room with another, you know, regular personal trainer or, or you know, um, strength conditioning coach, it makes you so unfair. <laughs> right? Because all of a sudden you're like, wow, you just dropped a half a second off this dude's 40 time in like no time at all, right? Yeah. And what was another funny story is, is I was working I've got one more for the visual system. We got time for that? Yeah, one more. Okay. So um, I work um, at a place that it's called Champion Health, but they're birthplace of ART, right? Active release technique. And um, so they're soft tissue work all the time. They're, they're pretty well known. I don't know if you've ever heard of them or not. Yeah. And um, this, uh, he, was, he was a major uh, triathlon winner. I can't say his name because of HIPAA stuff, but he had a really bad collarbone injury. And, um, he was pretty much all rehabbed up, but he just had some more sticking stuff that was going on. And they did a tons of ART on him and it just wasn't working. And, and Dr. Wood finally came to him. He goes, I give up. What do you got? And I go, all right, <laughs> let me see what I can do. So I, again, you know, I, I tried some motor mapping stuff that didn't work. And, you know, I was just like, again, racking my brain. I'm going, okay, let's do a little bit of, you know, peripheral work with him. So I just went around his peripheral vision and found just a few ticks. And like what you said earlier, if you can't do this, right, you might be in trouble. So I found those few ticks. I did some isometrics exactly where those were. And all of a sudden he was like, that's amazing. Like he lifted his hand, head over, hand over his shoulder after he just had ART treatment. That didn't work. Yeah. So, I mean, I know how many people in this country suffer from frozen shoulder especially because we're sitting on a computer doing this all day long and our you know shoulders are basically locked mm -hmm. in place uh, and then we go to sleep and we sleep under you know with the shoulder under the pillow and yeah. goes to sleep you wake up and ah, you can't move it it's frozen mm -hmm. so you know to be able to in like five ten minutes yeah get rid of somebody's frozen shoulder without having to rip them to shreds <laughs> like you know we were trained I was trained in, in a few different ways, but one yeah. of the ways was you know the, the Asian modalities, which is basically you just rip that sucker out of its frozen place mm -hmm. and then start moving it yep. and then rip it again and then start moving it. Yeah. You know, it's like this process of pain. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm I'm really not doing a good job here of uh, of promoting <laughs> the benefits of of you know seeing me. But if you're an elite athlete, it's all right. You don't mind. <laughs> but but uh, no, I mean, this is just one of the modalities yeah. that we are training. Also, also, obviously, AK and EK and right. some neurological work. But, you know, in five, 10 minutes, boom. Yeah. If you have frozen shoulder, would, it, would that be worth flying out to see somebody? You know, mm -hmm. absolutely get rid of your frozen shoulder in a day instead of somebody taking a year, two years, yeah. three years and not yeah. being able to, to knock that 
getting no progress. That out, no progress. So how often do you go to a doctor, a therapist, a chiropractor, whatever it is, and get no benefit? Mm -hmm. And maybe what you've got going on is in your head. Yeah. But it's not in your head as like, fake it's yeah this is an actual neurological yeah it's a neurological deficit that you have going on that's sending something to the brain that it doesn't like right so it's going to protect you in the best way it knows how hey there's a lot of stuff going on here right so let's keep that limited because it's protecting you right so you know it's funny a lot of the symptoms that people experience with ill health is really just the protective mechanism in general mm -hmm to that thing that's going on that's causing the symptom to in the first place. So for example, um, you know, dementia is inflammation in the brain. Then you have cholesterol that covers it up. That's called plaque. That's covering up the inflammation, trying to, you know, squelch yeah. the inflammation. And that blocks your memory centers because of the plaque, mm -hmm. but it's not the plaque that was the issue. And it's not the dementia that is the issue. That's mm -hmm. just the symptom. Mm -hmm. It's the inflammation, it's the right? Inflammation, yeah. Which mm -hmm. inflammation causes those nociceptors mm -hmm. to fire like it will, which yeah. explains a lot of people with chronic illness and chronic pain, yeah. like fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. things like that. So what do you do for somebody who, let's say they have MS or they have uh, yeah. Parkinson's disease, yeah. right? And now you're working on them to get better movement in their bodies. Mm -hmm. And you have this extra skill, extra tool yeah. of the neurological work so you can actually help them function with their brain better. What does that do? Yeah, I, I was, I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with a couple MS patients, which is awesome. Um, and, and they're the hardest workers in the room and my hat's off to them because they still show up even when they're in so much pain, you know, I've, <laughs> you know, I look at my life after that. And I'm like, I've got no problem, you know, but they'll come to me, you know, and, and I'll just have them do, you know, just simple things to be able to move their, their spine around to, to, to do complex movements that you wouldn't normally do in everyday life. So that way it creates what they call a little bit of neuroplasticity, right? So then that kind of opens up their motor movement a little bit. And also they're like, hey, I've, I've got a little bit less pain now, right? So like, for instance, I was working with one today and she just came in with like excruciating, like lower back issues, right? So I just had her do, you know, some simple, just midline um, mobility and working that around, working in different angles, twisting, and then doing a little bit of thoracic gliding one way, then the other way. And before you know it, she's still going to see the chiro after me, but she, she was f feeling much better, you know, and she said, I have much more control. Well, the, the, the other benefit to that is that now when she goes to the chiropractor after you, he's going to be able to do that adjustment so much more effectively oh, yeah. Yeah. and it's going to last so much longer. So that's where the collaboration between modalities has to come in. Has to. It yeah. has to start being a part of the mainstream thing that's happening in, in the industry because otherwise we're just kind of blowing smoke up the ass. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely. Yes, that's, that's one of the big things um, that me and the docs that work there, we work really well together, you know, and, and they'll introduce me, you know, they'll just be like, hey, can you show how to foam roll? And I'll just take a few minutes to be like, hey, do you mind if I, you know, watch you walk or whatever? And like, yeah, sure, you know, and I'll be like, okay, well, let's do a little bit of this. And then it's like, Hey, do you want to come and do an assessment? Yeah, sure. Right. So that's kind of how the handoff happens because Dr. Wood knows what I can do, but that's just his soft layup. And I was like, okay, let's give it to right. him because she's coming in week after week and with the same issue. Right. And I would rather it be versus a soft handoff. I'd rather it be a prescription pad. Yeah. That gets taken care of through the right. healthcare system yeah. that, we, I, I got that we create. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the point of this is that you're better than a prescription medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're going to get the job done faster. Mm -hmm. It's going to produce less waste. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Less times in the office, less ability for fraud to happen. Right. Right. Because the outcome would be more important than the procedures done. 
Yes, absolutely. And the amount of procedures done. So if the outcome is important to you as a patient or as a therapist or as a doctor, then you really need to, you know, listen to this way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I talk like this sometimes, I get into my my preachy mode, but the, the truth is, is that if you don't, more patients are gonna be in pain, more patients are gonna be addicted to drugs, more patients are gonna be wondering where they're, you know, where they're gonna find relief, they're going to be suicidal. They're going to be depressed because pain causes that in your chemistry. We know this. Mm -hmm. It stresses you out, which causes other kinds of diseases yeah. like heart disease and, you know, so on. Yes. Yeah, so, the system big time. so in general, we need to build a healthcare system that's not just designed the way that it is and maybe tweaked a little bit, but yeah. redesigned to function more. And that includes incorporating modalities like yours modalities yeah. you know corrective of chiropractic exercise. corrective exercise yeah. you know especially exercise for special needs oh absolutely right because how many personal trainers for instance really know how to treat somebody who comes in with diabetes who comes in with oh, ms yeah. who comes in with parkinson's mm -hmm. yeah there's not many out there right they're, they're kind of lost in the sauce a little bit and they're just like um i guess we'll do this and then they'll watch them do a movement pattern but they won't know how to fix it right or they'll you know do a few treatment or a few sessions few treatments and all of a sudden they won't see them forever because they got injured right. and they didn't want to tell them that they got injured doing that movement right right so it's incumbent upon all of us in the industry to start coming together and having these kinds of conversations so that we can change the system so that it works more effectively and efficiently so that our patients have a longer more joyful life right yeah absolutely 100 percent. so look, let's just you know talk about about maybe three to five things that the audience listening if it's a doctor's listening can do in order to change their own pain levels, their own issues so that they can be more focused and really create a new tomorrow today in themselves, some actionable steps that they can do. Such how, how they can like communicate with other trainers and stuff like that? Or? or exercises that they can do or something that they can actualize, you know, really to, today, tomorrow to take away the pain, whatever it is. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot to do with a, a balance. Um, and not just standing on a single leg right but also incorporating you know head and visual movements right being able to stare at an object and move your head around because then that gets in your inner ear right and gets that vestibular system activated and what people do, if, if you don't know what the vestibular system is right it's your main balance system like it's your master control of what your body's doing um and being able to just sit there and be on one leg, two legs, tandem stance, and be able to move your head around while staring at an object. That's that's one of the big ones that uh, we take away with um, uh, the PI cases I work with, right? Right. Brain injury, right? Because they don't know, because their brain kind of lies to them, and they'll have like a little bit of midline shift, and they won't even know it. And that's why they bump into things, and they and they can't close their eyes and stand upright without falling over, is because that's all out of whack. So if if you're normal and, and you just have a little bit of pain and you do some of that stuff sometimes that can also bring threat levels way down awesome yeah and then there's other things that you can do if you're you know um just on the computer for a long time and and you notice your eyes get really strained i mean an easy uh drill is called a soft gaze and what you do is you just put your finger up and you stare at your finger, but you also see your peripheral vision around you. So it's not like a hard stare. So it's just kind of soft, but I can see Ari right now. I can see the green screen. I can see the table over there, right? I can see below and above, right? And oftentimes people will be like, wow, I can I can read a little bit longer now without falling asleep, right? Right. <laughs> because their eyes are so strained. Um, and then another one is just, you know, move your body, man. Like in, in ways that you, you wouldn't think to move it such as like doing a with your thoracic if you can't sit sit, sit up and just slide back and forth without moving your hips you know 
that's something that can also be beneficial to you to be able to move that thoracic around so that lumbar doesn't have to do so much work. Awesome. These are some, uh, some really good tips. I like the uh, muscle confusion and, you know, that, that term has been used in, in bodybuilding yeah. kind of, you know, haphazardly, I guess, but muscle confusion is doing anything that anything physically that confuses the kinesthetic system. So if you're used to walking straight and at the same pace, just doing something like lengthening your stride or shortening your stride mm -hmm. confuses the muscles mm -hmm. and causes them to shift their behavior, yeah. so to speak. So you can fix ill-gotten patterns. For instance, if you're, if you're walking and your feet are like this instead of like this, right? Or like this, pigeon-toed or mm -hmm. duck-toed, right? If you start to focus on your feet and where your feet placement are, that's a muscle confusion yeah. that also works in your neurological system and yeah. can start ending that process of pain signaling yeah. to your brain, right? And yeah, and that's and that's where the muscle confusion comes from. Is is basically it's it's your, it's your brain. It's it's nothing to do with your 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 actual muscle system, right? It's it's to do with how your how your brain has mapped your body. So some people can't, you know, just do this, right? They, they can't just only move their, their thoracic spine. And, and what they call that, um, in, in Z health, what I've heard is called is, is neuromuscular amnesia. They, their brain just forgot how to do it, right? And all of a sudden they start to do it again. And they're like, hey, I, that's weird. I have, I have more flexibility in my hamstrings now that I can, you know, you know move right. in certain ways for some reason. And then, um, the feet you mentioned is huge. That's, that's one of the biggest uh, ones that we got from veterans too, because when you're a vet, right, what are you in all the time? Boots. Boots, right? Boots. <laughs> your, your ankle is just very, very immobile. So when you first start to do like such as like an ankle tilt to the side, right? So it's just kind of like if this is your ankle here and you just kind of tilt it and start putting more pressure and more pressure on it. And that's one drill I give a lot of my athletes who roll their ankles all the time is because what happens, why do people get sprained ankles? No flexibility in their ankles. That, yeah, they've gone somewhere that they haven't been before really fast and the nervous system goes, ah, right? And, it's, right. And, and that Golgi tendon organ's like, okay, I'm gonna activate the circuit breaker here <laughs> and you're gonna be in a lot of pain, right? Right. So, you know, after doing a lot of foot mobility, especially with a lot of veterans, man, and seeing how much more strength and power and um, flexibility they got uh, after that. But also when they first start doing it, they cramp like crazy because they're not used to doing it. Yeah. Then you got to get them pickle juice. Yeah. <laughs> pickle juice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I, I had a, a, when I was in gymnastics, I was three when I started gymnastics oh, and no I was, way. I was a gymnast for eight years. Um, not as good as my brother who was almost to the junior Olympics, like missed by three people, I think. Oh, wow. But uh, I was still, you know, I was competitive. It just wasn't as good as he was. Mm -hmm. And I would cramp a lot and I would have all these, you know, different injuries. Yeah. And uh, what ended up happening is we had our coach who did a ring routine. Mm -hmm. And I like doing rings. I was really good at iron crosses and wow. things like that. That's tough and movement. so, um, so I really was paying attention and he did a dismount and landed with both of his ankles turned out. And he pops right back up. Now, I mean, <laughs> mind you, he did a double flip off the rings and landed. It's a soft mat, but not, yeah, that, soft, not that soft, right? Yeah. But he landed, his ankles turned completely out. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is why we train ankles every day. Yeah. Right. But I've never heard anybody else ever say that. Yeah. That I've trained with in baseball or any other sport, <laughs> tennis. Nobody ever yeah. said, let's train your ankles, mm -hmm. right? No other therapist that I ever went to said, we got to train your ankles, right? Right? You're like actually the first person other than me, I think, <laughs> that has ever said, I train people's ankles. I give them ankle drills. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the most important oh, man, functioning things that you can do because your ankles, if you think about it, how your feet land is your foot lands and your ankle takes the shock that moves up to your calf and then your knee taking the shock and then moves up to your 
hip taking the shock, right? So you have mm -hmm. all these different shock absorbers on the way yep. in the kinesthetic movement. If you take out the ankles, all of that shock goes straight to your knees yeah. and your hips, right? So just turn your feet out and then bang on them or have somebody bang on your feet when they're turned out sometime. Yeah. And all you're gonna feel is your tibialis. I got runners mm -hmm. who get uh, shin splints all the time. This is the biggest issue that they oh, have yeah. is their, their feet are turned out or turned in slightly mm -hmm. and, all, and they're putting all that shock yeah. right onto their tibia. Right there. And it causes this to happen. So if you're a runner out there, you know, you just got a good tip. Yeah. Work on your gait, work on your, your foot placement, and you're probably going to get rid of that shin splint. Yeah. And, and another reason why it's so important to map out those ankles, right, is, yeah, have you ever heard of the humunculus? Yes. Right, the motor humunculus and the, and the sensory humunculus. You know, it's this thing with, like, big lips and big hands and big feet, right? And it's because it kind of represents of how much your brain it takes up. And your feet take up a lot of space, just like your eyes and lips and hands, right? So if if you don't have a good map of those, you're gonna cramp, you're gonna, you know, get all that, you know, shin splint stuff going on, and, and you're gonna have like knee issues. I've seen SI joint issues from it, right? Mm -hmm. I'd have somebody, I'm like, hey, walk down and back. And 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 their SI, their right one might be a little bit locked up. And I'll be like, okay, let's let's do a little bit of ankle movement, right? With your right ankle and do a little bit of you know, toe pulls and things like that. And they'll be like, okay, okay, this is kind of weird, but I'm like, okay, now welcome down back. They're like, that feels so much better. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. I took four tenths of a second mm -hmm. off of somebody's track time. Yeah. In under 10 minutes mm -hmm. by working on his feet and ankles. Yeah. I'm like, you're you're running, you're landing on them all day long, four or five hours a day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So don't you think that they should be worked on? And he had a foot thing. <laughs> this is where I, I find I find things really funny. We're getting yeah, you in know, the weeds now. We're getting in the weeds. He had a foot thing. He didn't like his foot being touched or seen or whatever. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't care. Uh -huh. I'm like, can you can you live with it for this moment? Right. right. And he did. He put up with it. And he went, Oh my God. Yeah. I had never felt like this. One of my other, you know, guys, like Atlanta Braves pitcher, mm -hmm. right? Retired. I work on his feet and we're at a PGA show, like PGA merchandiser show. Yeah. Right. And I get done working on his feet. He said it felt like a bullet hole had gone through his foot. Oh man. Right. He comes back the next day mm -hmm. and gets another session. He said, if I had this when I was still playing, it would have added 15 years to my career. Now, if you're a baseball player, you're a pitcher on he was Braves during the legacy pitching dynasty, yeah. right? With Maddox and Glavin and Smoltz. And I mean, he was one of those. Yeah. And add 15 years to that career. Oh, man. <laughs> in just the money that they make. You know, if you're an athlete millions, out there, millions. The, the stuff that somebody can do for you that's outside of the box of what happens inside your organization mm -hmm. is incredible. Yeah. Like the ability that you have once you go outside of your organization <laughs> and find a therapist who really knows their stuff, right? Is that you too could be a world champion. You know, really. I mean, that's that's the thing. Yeah. And for you who are just somebody who's having so much trouble getting out of your car. I I use this analogy a lot, getting out of your car, walking down a parking lot and through an entire grocery store without being in pain. If that's you, this is the kind of treatment that you really want to get. Not taking the pills, not getting addicted to the opiates. Yeah. And staying with the painful issues that you have. Right. But really getting some kind of therapy that that is good. And one day, and it, and, and really it's up to you guys a lot to push this onto your senators and governors and so on, is one day it's covered it's not an extra expense mm -hmm. because you're seeing a specialist, right? It's just included in, we want you to be healthy because that's the way of being an American is to be a healthy country mm -hmm. with a healthy military. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. 
I, one one last thing, because you work in the military a lot, and I get stuck on on wanting to change systems. You know, this is this is the premise of my whole show is we have these systems that are broken that aren't working, and we want to shift them and change them. So yeah, you know, on the the military front, the military doesn't train their at their soldiers to be injury free. Right. They don't have corrective exercise specialists working with them during boot camp. No right? These are places that we can make a difference. So mm -hmm. if you're working with VA, if you're working with vets, if you're working with PTSD, if you're working with any of these organizations, if you're a senator or a governor, you know, these are the people that you want on your team because we don't want our vets. But let me ask you a question. Do you think that it's easy these days to find somebody who could put on a, a sack, right? Yeah. And hoof it 10 miles through a jungle. Oh man. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then run away from somebody and still have enough wherewithal and energy and physical, you know, yeah. ability to be a soldier. Yeah. This is one of the things like for public safety and the safety of a nation to not have good health right. and to not be physically able to function yeah. to where you can put on a sack, you know, that's mm -hmm. 40 to 70 pounds yes, yeah, and, mm -hmm. you know, walk around through a jungle all day long. Yeah. And we've, we've got an issue that we have as a national security issue, the healthcare of our nation. Yeah, absolutely. Healthcare. And then, you know, looking at, you know, the military boot camps that bring these kids in, right? You're not dealing with the same animal that you had in 1960, right? Now you're dealing with a much bigger animal, right? And then you're asking them to run, you know, three to five miles, right? <laughs> right out the gate, you know, and you got some guy huffing and puffing. His, I mean, his, you know, body just cannot take that punishing yet, right? And and a little bit of vetting there is probably, you know, needed, but you know, as, as well as there's no really posterior chain involvement in any of the exercises, right? Everything is anterior. Everything is push-ups. Everything's sit-ups. Everything's, you know, humping. Everything is, you know. So that running. means everything is in the Everything's front of your body, front. not in the back of your body. So posterior is back of your body. Anterior is the front of your body. So just in case, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, people didn't, didn't know what that didn't meant, catch that, yeah. right? So pushing versus pulling, right? right? So everything is a push movement in the military. And most of the instabilities come from not having a strong posterior. Mm -hmm. So when you debalance those kinds of exercise routines, you get people moving forward, right? Yeah. And eventually they end up looking at their toes <laughs> when, when they're 80 years old. Yeah. Is, right? Because they can't raise their body up. Yep. And so you've all seen old soldiers, yeah. right? And they, they, they're, they, they started here, you know, yep. but then when you see them, they're either here or they're down further or they're arching down mm -hmm. because that's what happens to the yep. body when you only are working that anterior Everything tight here. Everything starts pulling. Um, and, and then another, you know, if you're, you're talking about, you know, national emergency, you know, I'm seeing, you know, kids nowadays, their posture is horrible, you know, with the way they're sitting and all that is again in the front of the body, everything's anterior, right? So they have the Zoom class, right, that they're on, then they get on their tablet, right? And they get on their phone and they text and they're always in this position, right? And and you see them like this and then you see their feet turned out and their, and their knees out. I, I call it the no acetal syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> they have no butt, they have no back muscle, everything is just so crunched forward. And that just brings on a whole other host of issues and movement problems and patterns that come into fruition later in life to where they're like, Ooh, this is in pain all the time. Right. And you know, the, the thing that they don't understand is happening is when they're going forward like that, your diaphragm is here, yeah. your heart is here, your lungs are here. And you start crunching these down, you don't have as much deep ability to breathe deep. Mm -hmm. Your organs start getting crunched on and yep. squeezed on, and they can't function as readily yeah. and availably as normal function would be. Right. So, you know, everything is connected. Everything. And 
we, we really need to get that, you know, both for our physical bodies, for the systems that we create, the environment we create, everything is connected. There's a great uh, show series that uh, I just watched on Netflix called Connected. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how the, the world is interconnected. Oh, wow. and it's a great series if anybody gets an opportunity to watch yeah, it, seen that. because it literally goes through like, how the Sahara, how the sand in the Sahara blows with the wind, and uh, and is the fertilizer basically has the nutrients and the whatever to grow all the plants in the Amazon, oh, wow. right? In I mean South America, like sand from here blows to there. How does the sand also help to stop hurricanes? Right. You know, I mean the interconnectivity huh. of the universe and of the world of yeah. the earth of nature is so vast. Yeah. And when we screw with it, like we've done <laughs> in so many ways, mm -hmm. and especially the last hundred years, mm -hmm. when we screw with nature, nature will screw back with us. <laughs> and we're, we've been getting the hard end of the screwing at this point. So is the money more important or is the screwing we're getting more important? Because we're allowing the screwing to happen for the gain of money, mm -hmm. which is something we made up in our heads, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Something that's not so real. Right. So I'm just giving you guys a little bit to think about here. You know, we'll, we'll, we're going to end the call. You gave some great tips, Chris. Awesome. Um, where can people get a hold of you if, if they wanted to fly out to Colorado so and... Uh, enjoy the snow and, and beautiful mountain air mountain air uh so you can go to www.kgmaxfitness.com it's kgmaxfitness.com and you can find me there you can find me you know where i work and, and my phone and all that to schedule if you want sounds good thank you so much for being here chris this has been another great episode of create a new tomorrow i'm your host ari gronich and you know just remember the world is interconnected. What we do makes a difference and what we don't do makes a difference. And the things that we know are that our mind creates our movement, mm -hmm. both emotionally as well as physically. physically yeah. And if you want your mind and your emotions and your body to work in sync and work more effectively and efficiently, Work on those visual keys, you know, yeah. work on that direction, work on your balance. Mm -hmm. You know, I have my son doing these great balance exercises, like walking heel to toe on a straight line of the tile. He's six years old. Oh, wow. but we're building his balance up nice. after a head trauma. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. You can try it. Go, you know, look at a line on, on your floor a grout line or something like that yeah. and heel to toe and try to walk on that straight line without falling over. And then heel to toe while looking forward and turning your head. If that's too easy. Exactly. See, again, some great, great tips. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. And this has been another episode. We are out. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate all you do to create a new tomorrow for yourself and those around you. If you'd like to take this information further and are interested in joining a community of like-minded people who are all passionate about activating their vision for a better world, go to the website, createanewtomorrow.com and find out how you can be part of making a bigger difference. I have a gift for you just for checking it out and look forward to seeing you take the leap and joining our private paid mastermind community. Until then, see you on the next episode.